Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Okay, engagers, and today we have Dutch Driver. Um, I'm sure you've heard at some point of Dutch Driver if you've been into the gamification world. Um, he is one of the moderators of the gamification hub. So, Dutch, the first question is, are you prepared to engage? I'm ready, Rob. Let's go. <laughs> Let's get the the car moving right now. So, Dutch, Let's is... put our foot on the accelerator and let get going. <laughs> Let's do it. So Dutch, he is a fanatical apostle for gamification, organizational development, and communication. His 15 plus years in organization development embraces a broad reach of sectors in aerospace, federal government, health care, higher education, and nonprofits. He's a NASA certified Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and a certified Scrum Master in Agile Project Management Process. He's also certified at Master Level 3 in Gamification. I'm guessing that's uh, the Sententia certification, isn't it, Dutch? Uh, no, it's actually um, uh, Gabe Zickerman. Uh, so I was I was, game, I was Level 3 ah, before yeah. Monica put true. together Sententia. True, so that's that, true. That was a much higher, uh, I don't want to say t- Sententia because they, they've got their own schema. I, I, I was there through Level 1, but... I went to, okay, I probably need to do level two and three, but, you know, after a while, you may know more than the certifications do. So. <laughs> For sure. So that's a master level three in gamification. Again, Gabe Zickerman was one of the first people to talk about this, and his courses were definitely pioneering the field. And he's also certified as a Myers-Briggs type indicator provider. He has a BA degree from McMurray University and an MA degree from Texas A&M University. So, Dutch, is there anything else that we missed from that introduction that you would like to, to mention before we start? Yeah, I'm over-certified and under <laughs> You're not the first person to, to, to have it, but you're certainly in this podcast at least the first person to certify it. <laughs> That's, that, you know, the thing about it is, all those certifications, they they really kind of feed into my lifelong learning model, or not model, but my my intrinsic. That's 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 my thing. Uh, in Monica, you mentioned Monica already, and hopefully you're not your your group knows that Monica Cordonetti would talk. We would talk about deep diving, and I'll find a rabbit hole and off I go. You know, <laughs> certainly Monica is actually one of the very few uh, two-time guests her her second interview will be coming up soon probably oh, cool. near uh, yours because we will be talking about gamecon 2018 so that's that's i'll, I'll leave it out there <laughs> okay we, that's a good one that's a that's a good prelude to, to listening to what she has to say hopefully i'm getting more articulate that i'm stuttering here and I'm, i don't understand that because i'm i have degrees in speech communication you would think that would actually help that happens. That happens. So, so let, let's get the the muscles building up. And the first thing that we would like to know, Dutch, is what does a regular day with with Dutch look like? Well, I get up in the morning at about mm, eight or eight thirty, and so then I do my social media. I I review Facebook, Instagram, and Reddit, and then we usually have breakfast with my mom. And then, then what happens is I come back, back into my, where my laptop is and start through the day. The day from then on is right now is involved with chatbot. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I was a deep, I like to do deep dive. I've been doing deep dive on chatbots for about a year. I'm putting together a, a life coaching chatbot right now. That's, I have a few more things that I want to add to it. I have a, I used to, since I used to live in Silicon Valley, I know that I've got a uh, founder syndrome where the, <laughs> the kid going out is not quite prepared. So he, that uh, I don't like to think of myself as a perfectionist, but also having degrees in communication, I also know once you put it out there, you can't take it back. So, you know, you're kind of caught in a rock and a hard place between those two. And so I'm, I'm like 
yeah, okay, I'm close enough. I need to pull the trigger, which is what I'm trying to do before the end of the summer. That makes a lot of sense. And we have to say that we wish you all the best of success in, well, thank you. in those chat bots. I, we have uh, coincided in maybe one or two Facebook groups around chat bots. It's something I've been mildly researching as well. Um, but the, the, the broadband that each person has is, is as, as far as you can get. And it hasn't been, as we spoke in the pre-interview chat, it's not in the top of my priorities right now. But it's certainly, I think it will in the near future because it's something that I'm very interested in and there's a lot of potential there for, for many things. The hard thing there is, and this kind of taps into it, is you, when you're working with chatbots at the moment, I've mentioned to the guys that do uh, the two platforms the one I'm most familiar with is MiniChat, and the second one is uh, ChatFuel, and both platforms don't really have an inbuilt gamification modification. One of the, one of the issues that you run across uh, in the chatbot community is churn, which is you get a lot of people on the subscriber list, but they stay for a very, very short amount of time, and that's one of the issues that I'm trying to overcome because, you know, with gamification, it would be, okay, what what do I need to do? And that's kind of why I'm putting together this chatbot so I can kind of figure that out. That makes a lot of sense. Go out and experiment and try and, and do new things. Yeah, you and I were talking about your mailing list. <laughs> yes. And, and one of the things that you find out after you've been in chatbots long enough is the click-through rate on Messenger chatbot is so much higher. I mean four times higher than over the roof absolutely or, i mean it's like unbelievable and it's still new enough that people are it's kind of like email back whenever you used to get on aol and you get you've got mail it's it's an exciting thing <laughs> it's still still is exciting for sure it is and every new i mean having been around for a while every new platform creates that it's it's that dopamine hit of that uh, interval and conditioning that you look at it and you go, oh, cool. You know, wonder what's going to happen to me now. I, th I think we're getting a little jaded because it's taking longer and longer or taking shorter and shorter amount of time for us to get jaded. And used to when we get email, we, I mean, we're addicted to it. Back in the 90s, I couldn't hardly wait to check my email. Now, eh. <laughs> you, you'd rather stay away from it. I actually use Messenger more. Uh, I think you and I connected over Messenger. Yes, yes, we did. You, your birthday was recently passed. Yep, I turned sixty-two. Wow, nice yeah. time. Last, last Thursday. Yeah. So uh, you know, as people move, as the behaviors move, you got to keep up the platforms. And the one platform that I've actually said, okay, there's no real reason to go into a deeper dive on Snapchat. I don't understand it. I've, I've got an account, I've been on it for about two or three years, and it's changed so much over the years. I went, you know, just staying up with Instagram is enough. <laughs> <laughs> and they're taking over the market. But I don't want to get into the deep end of Instagram right now. What, no. I, what we would like to get into right now, Dutch, is is the, the story mode, going into story mode right now. And it's about perhaps what we would like to call your, your favorite fail, especially in gamification, your first attempt in learning or something that happened to you when you were, when you were attempting a project or, or where you were, were attempting something related to gamification and you didn't, you didn't get to where you wanted to. It was uh, some failure, but that actually led you either to a future success or, or to a massive learning that you certainly were able to incorporate in the future. So to tell us that story, Dutch. So that one really ties back to my time back in Alabama. I was deep into I was deep into gamification. I, I mean, you talked about the uh, uh, engagement alliance, uh, master level three or expert level three. I also was trained by Yuka Chow and Mario Herger and Monica Cornetti. So I had all the training. What I can tell you is all the training does not translate into getting a lot of gamification projects. I got several, but they were usually, you know, they don't they don't value that yet. So you ran in, I ran into several projects, and one of them was with a local uh, maker's. Uh, what am I trying to say? A maker's shop where they where they had CNC machines, and they were they did 
3D printing and all this kind of stuff. And what they were trying to do is work their membership to where it would motivate the members to do this. Um, I wrote I wrote it out really well. But what happens with when you work with entrepreneurs, and this was an entrepreneurial effort, was one of my major fails is working with entrepreneurs because they don't see the need of it because they're still trying to get to their pivot point. And you can create something that they don't see as aligning to where they're going. And that was a major fail because while I spent a lot of time working out this and, and, and thinking of how all this stuff works together, you didn't get to implement it. And that was probably the major fail for me. What would you say is, is something that, that you would have maybe done differently or, or after having this experience, some, some pitfall that you would avoid or, or something you would do before getting to that project or, or some, some approach that you, you would change after, after such an experience? What would you do differently in that sense? I was doing it as a pro bono, but at the, at the way I think about this now, because we mentioned earlier that I've been around on the web for a long time. And it was the internet before it's the web is there is the premium type of stuff where people give away content. And I, I I understand why they do it. But when you're trying to when you're trying to get a start and they're trying to get a start, it, it sets a conflict. So I, what I would do different is have them put some skin in the game and need to pay you a hundred bucks or something. Because when you do things for free, it's not valued that much. Uh, I, I just I'm, I'm really coming in to believe that when you give away stuff for free, they don't have any skin in the game and then they can walk away. It's too cheap to walk away and, and skin in the game, as Dutch is saying, it could be putting a hundred bucks. It could be it could be many things, um, but getting the people involved and invested, that's that's something that uh, near AL's model talks about. When you do the the investment time, that could be putting in your information. It could be as a user, of course, not not as a client, but it could be putting in your information. It could be personalizing something within your within your system, etc. When you do you you do some sort of investment, some personal investment, you are more tied to that solution. You are more interested in getting further, unless you do, and unless you do that, it's very easy for you to just drop off. And, and that's why I think that what Dutch is saying is is fundamental. It's super clear. Whether it's with a client and asking them for for money or some money at least, so that they have some skin in the game, the the, the concept itself of of having some personal investment, again financial or not, in in the game is fundamentally important, so that people actually are committed to what you're offering. So thank you for that story. It's it's very 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 useful, I think, for for all of the engagers who are who are listening. Well, the other thing there, since we're talking about motivation, and in a lot of ways we kind of walk a, a parallel path in persuasion and gamification and persuasion are not that far apart from each other. And when you cross the threshold, there's a trust level that you cross when people give you the money to start working on a program is it also crosses over into ownership. And there is a, an aspect of what you were talking about is an ownership uh, of the, of your work. And while I had put a lot of effort into it and it's fairly complex, uh, one of the more complex project projects that I'd worked on, the guy eventually wouldn't, he wasn't feeling it. So instead of modifying it and making it work for him, he just walked away from it. And that does happen quite frequently. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And that, that ownership aspect is what makes it worthwhile for for the other part because you always have to remember and we've mentioned to our users very often that user could be again your client it could be many it could take many forms if you don't take into account their motivations and their their ideas and how to get them to to perform the actions you expect them to then they probably won't and that's that's another key learning from from that at least for me you need to you need to think about using your gamification skills on your client yes and I, I hadn't actually, at that time, I had not put those two together because, like I said, persuasion and motivation are hand in hand with each other. But I did the motivation and not the persuasion. So you got to work on both. Yeah. And, and now making a, a 180 degree spin uh, Dutch, we would like to know what is the story actually of success? Something that you, 
you've done and that you could be proud of and you could tell the, the engagers um, as many details as you can. Of course, I know there's many NDAs and there's people who don't want to talk about specific companies, but as many as many details as you can give us about an example of something that you felt actually went right and that you could you could say was a success for you when when using gamification. Again, whether that's a client, whether uh, that that's a system that you created for a client, whether that's using it on the client itself or or some something related to education. Um, tell us that story, Dutch. Okay, there's the the one that I like to in that particular thing is before I even really understood what gamification was. This is back in probably 2009, somewhere in there. Before I was really, I, I'd heard of it, but I really hadn't done all the certification stuff. In my organizational world, I have I was trained like you mentioned earlier, Scrum Master. In organization development, I was invited by the NASA uh, space shuttle group, the leadership group, they were having trouble communicating. They were getting ready to shut down the shuttle and the, and the leadership group was not really expressing that. And that there's something within the NASA world where they don't want to be disloyal to the group. So one of the things that I did was I went in to the group and used some agile principles, which is, uh, by having them write down some of the issues on us on a um, index card, or we would discuss it. We would open up the discussion on the index card, and then we'd have them prioritize it based on using agile process for stories. And as they went through, that's how they found out what the priorities were for the leadership. And we did that by quantifying it so that okay, we have the question out there or the issue out there, and the group would then give me numbers. So it, it lets you kind of know within the room because it's like a secret ballot. Um, and I think I used uh, Fibonacci numbers. So there's a range between 1 to 88, I think, was the, the range I used, where you would put down your card. I had, I had cards developed from 1 to 88, where they put down how how important or how big a deal is this for you. And then they would play their card face down. Nobody would get to see it. And then they would all flip. Once they were all played, then we'd flip them over. And the, the discussion that came out of that, because you have different people, you have people on different ranges of the spectrum. And what what happened there is the, the leader of the group that had us come in said that this was one of the best discussions they had. They knew that these guys were talking about this stuff around the, the uh, water cooler, but they would not put it out there because they didn't want to be disloyal. So it was one of those kind of mixed different different aspects. There's a gamification part. There's some organization development stuff. There's obviously some Scrum Agile stuff that was going on. But it was a way to, instead of being for programming, it was a way to bring the organization and get the conversation going so that they could take what the leadership was worried about and then actually do some problem solving. And for me, that was one of the biggest, biggest uh, gamification wins, even though I didn't know it was. <laughs> Finding out later it was certainly a big win for you, I'm sure. It was, yes. <laughs> that's a that's a fantastic story, engagers, because you can see the power of many things here. Um, the, the, the one that that I could even say it's almost a, a game strategy is anonymizing uh, certain aspects. When you anonymize in a game, you're you you bring out some some uh, you know parts of the character of people that you wouldn't get to know otherwise, and that's something that games are very powerful at doing. You if you want to bring out the real character of, of people, and we've heard this before, you might want to sit them down and play a game. And Dutch was able to achieve this through something slightly different, but I would again I would argue that perhaps it could be not necessarily learned from games, but it's something that games are actually very good at doing. So anonymizing those those answers was something fantastic that that is a key learning here. And getting the people actually to talk through all these these things is is very very important in in such a situation. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to you'd like to point out as a, as a key learning from your experience, Dutch. Now, now that's the that's the probably the pinnacle because the the actual like I was saying the the actual leader of the of the leadership group 
said these guys they broke the, they broke the ice and that was a key thing is to break the ice and use games to break the ice this happens over and over when you're group facilitating or doing some organization development is to get the group to give you what they need versus the top down of what the leadership the actual leadership want is is very key and i've I've done that over and over with game thinking. It's just, just it's just a part of who I am, I guess. That's fantastic. So, Dutch, is there? Would you say that there is a process that you follow or, or followed when you were you were deep diving into gamification? When you were going to create some sort of, of product or some design of gamification, was there any sort of of you know steps you took, or was there any sort of secret formula that you had? Okay, so that kind of leads me to what I was talking about, the, the two things that I've really I've discovered, but I haven't really talked about. One, we'll talk about one because the other one is really abstract. But the first one is use the use of metaphor. And this is where my friend Monica uses narrative. I use metaphor. And let me explain how that works. I, I think one of the things, one of the problems that I, that I see continually pops up is Users lose um, their motivation because the game gets stale. Uh, so to keep them going, you have to come up with new new ideas. And one of the things there that I took up is that using sports metaphors. Now, this is a particular pattern for sports metaphors. So let's start at the first of the year uh, in January. In January, you got the you got the um, You've got the national uh, here in the states. You've got the national college football um, uh, uh, championship. Then follow that within about a, three or four weeks after that, you have the Super Bowl. Okay, so in January you want to use the Super Bowl. In February, now this is not sports, but it, it works just the same. You go in and use the Oscars, the movie, use the movie thing. And you develop you develop your gamification around these things, and then in the um, in March you use March Madness, which is basketball, and then later on in April, I think the way I have it set up is you use the Masters, uh, which is golf, and you go through different things and set up your games using the rules of loosely using the rules as your motivational framework for your developing the game. That way, as you as you follow that down through the through the year, you should be able to come up with twelve different games using something that happens every year. Um, the reason that I came up with that is because the the rules are fairly well known. You do not have to do a whole lot of onboarding to get people to understand what you're doing, and that to me is as a communication guy is they already know the rules. You just Build your thing around it, and one of my one of my very successful things I didn't talk about this one as much is I developed a a uh, a college football playoff schema for a training program for a for a major pharmaceutical, and and they were doing a leadership uh, not I'm not a leadership but a product rollout, and we set it up where it was they played the game, and then the winners of that game got to select the members of their team and then the teams played against the other team so there are two teams it's kind of like a playoff and a competition roll up into one that's fantastic and that, that's a great idea dutch i i love it and and it's it's very well tailored towards your your potential audience in the in the states where where the people you're you're targeting are are pretty well aware of the rules of those sports and, and those things that are happening throughout the year And it's something that is almost evergreen because you can always be using that right. if, because the calendar keeps keeps up every year. Well, the teams change too. You know, the yeah. teams change, the movies change, uh, the players change, all that. So you can ch you can take you can use that and adapt it for uh, adapt it and change your your um, and still still keep it fresh. Right, and that's the big thing is because based on habituation, it gets old. And that that's one that to me I think that's probably the, one of the biggest thing is they get static and they get they get old it gets old and they don't get motivated they don't see the motivational there but a frequent change 
uh, uh, on a monthly level would be a way to refresh their their interest. There'll be people who win. There'll be the football people who win more. There'll be the movie people who have a chance. There'll be the golfers. You know, different people will have a chance to win. So it's not always um, the killers, the, the the killers and the achievers. There could be some churn there, and that's what I like about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. So it, the, the next question that we w we're going to get into, and it seems that we ha already have almost an answer to it, and this is the 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 not so deep dive uh, section of the interview uh, is if there's something that you feel that every almost any gamification project can can benefit from and I'm I'm guessing I know where the answer is going towards well you could say metaphor um, <laughs> uh, using analogies that would be one uh, it's and it's not that far from what Monica is talking about on the narrative it's just taking it and using the rules that that are already out there so you don't have to re-educate them on what the rules are that's probably the one thing I would say is use the familiar instead of the uh, of the obscure. Now the obscure you got you got a lot of room, to, but you got a lot of room to be creative. But you also have to do a lot of education communication pieces to get people to understand what you're doing. Yeah, and and it's uh, we had John Meehan, uh, a, a teacher, an English teacher recently who was talking about overload and maybe if you're trying to if you're trying to use something and he was talking about his students in, at school he said well if you're trying to explain them what pokemon is is that they they have to do a review on a, on a novel and each student does a different novel there's also you're they're also getting to get introduced into the novel and then you have the dice which they haven't ever seen because it's one of these gamer dice and then you have this other thing another thing they, they get overloaded so they, they are, they're getting so much information so much new information to process that it's actually maybe too much and it's not going to get you anywhere and and that's very related to that and i think it's it's very very well stated in the sense that the the least they have to to learn and understand new the easier it will be for them to accept that incorporate that and use it for for whatever purpose you're actually getting in through there because i'm sure that your your gamification project was not about getting people to understand golf or basketball it's actually to to use those metaphors to get them somewhere else Correct. And, you know, we, we talked about the onboarding, but there's the cognitive overload that we ha that we face uh, constantly, especially working with change. It's people do not really love learning new things. E even me, I'm a deep guy. I love learning new things, but there are certain things that I do not. You, you could talk to me about mathematics and I could bet I would turn you off and there's very little you could do to get me to do it because the threshold to get me up to calculus level is so high that it would it would be very very difficult to do and i'm likely to shut down you give me something like addition and gamify that and I'm, I'm being i'm using it as an example not something i've actually thought of you do not have to take people all the way from step one to the mastery level they already know what to do and that's that's a big onboarding thing uh, and the cognitive load is so low they are able to enjoy it. That's my thinking. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Dutch, we would like to also know, what is your favorite game? Oh, man. You opened up a can of worms. <laughs> my favorite game. I'll tell you one that I played the longest and the one that I love now. Sure. The first one is Sherlock. And I played this thing back on the PC, and what it is is it teaches you logic. Uh, the guy's name is Everett Kaiser Software. You can get this as an app on your phone now. And I played it, but I have played it on PC. So it's like a, it doesn't use words to teach you. It uses symbols and, and basically symbols. So it's symbolic, kind of symbolic logic, but it's, it's, it's a very, very cool way to, work on your thought processes because it and that's why i loved it i played it for probably played it nearly every day for over a year <laughs> more than a year i mean because i played it all through grad school it was just you'd get so you'd get so caught up in your stuff and you would lose your train of thought and this is one way to kind of okay this is relationships to that and it's it's hard to explain it's easy to play the other game is more surreal than that, and it's it's on it's on my PS3. When I was doing gamification, we were talking. There's so much video game um, 
vernacular and things that the the younger player, the younger people on the on gamification hub knew that I didn't know because I hadn't played video games. I stayed away from video games because I know they're extremely addicting. The one that I found that is probably the most addicting one for me is called Journey. It's not it's not a really a competitive game. It's more about I don't know what to say. It's more of a zen like you're just going through an environment. There are some mechanics there. One of the cooler me- mechanics were is you can meet other players there, but you cannot talk to them other than a sound that sounds like a bleep. It's just comforting. It's just the most meditative game I have ever found. And I, I haven't played it in a year, and I kind of, I've kind of i been missing it. So I've been watching it on YouTube uh, uh, walkthroughs, and and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that part. And I'm like, oh, really? I, I missed that part, so I need to go back and play it again. I've missed it. <laughs> It's really easy to slip into the environment. It's just a couple hours, even for a complete walk walkthrough. It's just a couple hours. If you're really stressed or something like that, I recommend this game because it will take you out of your head. And that's what you need to do if you're really stressed. Meditation and different types of meditation. Playing games yeah. is one. And it's something I try to start many mornings with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you and I need to talk about how we can do that. How how we can do that really easy. <laughs> Beautiful. So, is there is there anybody Dutch that you would like to listen to interviewed in in an interview like this one in Professor Game? I let's see, who would I want to listen to? I you know I've heard Anche talk several times, but not enough. <laughs> Anche Mark uh, Markuski. I'll get his name wrong. I always do. My Texas tongue doesn't twist around that name because reading it and saying it are not the same thing. Oh, it's it's Polish. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Out of all the people that hang around, he creates more gamification product than pretty much anyone else. He continually creates models, and he's always got something new. I think he's a little bit off of it now, but he's still got tons and tons of content that he's not really discussed. And you could pick one of those, one of his blog posts, and have him talk about that. Yeah, he's phenomenal. He's absolutely phenomenal. I met him, um, well, I met him, I saw him again last year in Gamification Europe, and I met him in Gamification World Conference in 2016, I believe. Um, he was a guest uh, by now. It should be like six or seven weeks ago, but I would certainly have him again to speak about something else and go go deeper into into a certain topic. That's something that we have to explore yet in the podcast, but we certainly will because there's there's many interesting people in which you can you can get almost into a small masterclass uh, throughout forty minutes, fifty minutes that that we could do in an interview. The other one, and I'm trying to think of his last name at the moment. Uh, David from Gamification Hub, Rob. It's David. Um, could He's a be Canadian guy. David Chandros could be. That's the one. Yes. Yes. Listening certainly. to him, I have not listened to him very much. And picking his brain, I think you would have probably a pretty good time out of that. Definitely, definitely. He's he's into education, especially around healthcare. Uh, as much as I've read, I know he he kind of had a podcast. I'm not sure if he's continued uh, creating episodes. It was very short. Um, trying to remember the name, but I, if I don't have my phone next to me, which I always put in silence before <laughs> the interviews or put it outside, um, I won't be able to find it. But it, it has something to do with his company or the company he works with, like GDC or something like that. You know, he just got promoted. He just he's got a new job where he got promoted. And I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't, there's something in my the back of my mind that something happened to him professionally here within the last month or maybe two months, and I, I it's unclear what it is, but something happened to him where he got I think he got a promotion at, at, during the medical center or something like, or maybe at the university I forget. Yeah, but he would be one. He would be another interesting because he's been doing it long before his call gamification. He's been he's been working with it for like twenty or thirty years. Yeah, he has. He definitely has. And on that same note, because you've mentioned at least Anjay, who was also an author in gamification, is there any book that you would recommend to somebody who's interested in gamification? It could be directly in gamification, it could be game design, or it could be anything else that you think is somewhere you can draw inspiration from. I would go back to uh, Jane McGonigal's first book. Uh, uh, Reality is Broken? 
Oh, reality's broken. And Super Butter was the second one. Yes. Go back to the first one, because um, the game, the game, the game world is is more what she talks about. And if you really are not familiar with the game world, that would be where I would go read her book, because it brings to mind a lot of the uh, practical applications to it, even though it's abstract. She, the way she talks about it, she'll bring in a case study or something. And that's good for people who do not understand how this works. Yes, definitely. And she's a super interesting person, author, and and likewise. I follow her uh, very avidly in, on Twitter. Um, she talks about gamification and other things, and she's super, super interesting. And that book is fantastic. The other thing, since you're kind of asking for where my influences were, the other one is to go to, to uh, YouTube and look for gamification tutorials. And they're, they're um, in particular, uh, Gabe uh, Zickerman does one at Google. Jane does one at Google. I don't know if it, who else does one there, but if you can find Google Talks and gamification, you're going to get some really good stuff. Hmm, I've never tried that. I'm gonna. I'm certainly going to try it. Guess you, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there. Yes. Yes. You can find a lot of examples we use or put into some of those some of those YouTube videos. Fantastic. Um is there is there something that you would call your your superpower when you when you do gamification or, or when you think about something and you then you perhaps realize that you actually used gamification. Is there is there something that you would say is kind of your sweet spot in in gamification? I think uh, user experience would be where because I've been around computers for a long time, I can look at an interface and say, okay, you know, this is not as intuitive as you think it is. Um, so that I would <laughs> it think never I'm, is. <laughs> I know, it, it never, you know, like I said, I've been around a long time and I remember in the early days of the web, oh, this is intuitive. And I'm like, I do not understand what you're trying to get me to do. And, and so onboarding, that's a, that's that communication piece. I would think I'd be very good with, because I've done change management, I understand a few more things about an interface than than your average user. I guess that I, I would think that would be a big thing. That's beautiful, um, Dutch. Is there is there any final piece of advice you would like to give the engagers before before we take off? Um, for your audience, uh, well, I've I've dropped a lot of hints oh, in there. Definitely, so, definitely. So the, the gamification hub would be one. Twitter, uh, the hashtag for Twitter. I honestly, I use I use TweetDeck there, so I can aggregate all the Twitter the uh, Twitter gamification gurus in the world. And so, I, when I'm really back into it again, I will go back and hit them again. It's kind of going on the it's kind of in a slump right now because. I think it's it's kind of getting it's working its way in. Somebody's going to find it again. Um, <laughs> Definitely, the, the gamification hub that you were mentioning, it's on Facebook. Um, it's kind of open, but you need to be um, accepted, as far as I can remember, by the administrators. I, I know yeah. I was a, a bit. Um, I don't want to say overwhelmed or intimidated, but maybe you got it, and the message was something like, "Oh, why are you?" getting at it and, and what's your interest and it, I, I I actually liked it and, and then it, when I was accepted it gave me some ownership of getting accepted in the group and I felt a lot more committed into participating at least initially into the group and it, it like, kind of gets you kick and that's something I love about that group as well and, and that particular group is um, back when I started about 2011 I guess 2012 we didn't have I was unaware of that group I was unaware of any, any of the names I've talked about today. I was unaware of them. They're all in Gamification Hub. Uh, Gabe Zickerman, Anshe, Yukai Chow, Monica, uh, you. I don't, I don't consider myself. I, I just post a lot of stuff. <laughs> he's Dutch is certainly very active and very and that's something that keeps the group alive. And he's certainly a knowledgeable person inside the group. Well, thank you. Because of it, because of many many reasons, experience being one of them for sure. And and so finding your tribe would be one thing that I would I would say is find your find your tribe. Um, and gamification is one. There are several gamification um, groups on Facebook. There, 
There's one on, there's two on Reddit that I, two or three on Reddit. And they're not as active as they used to be. There's some, there's some groups there on LinkedIn. I don't think they're as nearly as active as the hub is at the moment. But find your tribe and then work within your tribe. That's fantastic advice. And, and to, to be fair, that's one of the, thing, of the things that got me started. Uh, I, I, ha- I would add to that uh, of the getting started, what I did in my personal experience, the, the Coursera course of Kevin Werbach. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, a very nice place to get started as well. And, and definitely the gamification hub to get your ideas flowing and to listen to other people and, and give your input and get feedback on your, on your input itself. It's, it's fantastic. So that, that's my big advice is find your tribe. Uh, you will find, for me in Alabama, I'm, I always talk about being the the uh, the prophet in the wilderness because there was nobody nearby that I could talk to about this stuff. All <laughs> of my interaction has been online through Skype and Gamification Hub and Twitter and, and conferences that we go to. Exactly, exactly. So you don't want to be in a lonely place, even if you if you physically are. Uh, there's many things online that that can get you to feel what other people as well are doing. And, and I have to say that the gamification world has been growing and we've, we've seen it, especially in the people who are practicing it and hopefully in the people who are, are doing a good job at practicing gamification. So thank you very much, Dutch. This has been a pleasure speaking to you. Before, before we leave, I would certainly like to, to, to leave some, some form of contact uh, that you would like to offer to the audience. That could be Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, whatever you w- wish to, to drop or, or all of them so that they can contact you and, and, and you know talk to you about these things, uh, find you in the hub as well. Uh, and then we'll say it's game over. All right. So here it's Dutch underscore driver on Twitter. It is um, Dutch Driver on Facebook. Uh, I have several different Facebook pages, but the one I gave Rob was Game Gambitions, G A M B I T I O N S, Gambitions. My email address is Dutch dot Driver at Gmail. Fantastic Dutch, and we'll we'll have all of these in the show notes. So if you go to professorgame dot com, uh, put in the search bar Dutch, you will certainly find this fantastic interview. Thank you very much, Dutch. This was a pleasure speaking to you. It's an interview I've been looking forward for for quite some time. And it's now time to say it's game over. It is game over. Thank you so much, Rob. I enjoyed being with you and the questions were great. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. And I hope you enjoyed this interview with Dutch. But do you have any questions that you would also like to ask to future guests? Then go to professorgame.com slash question and ask your question. If it's selected, it will come up in a future episode and you will get your answer. And before you go on to your next mission, would you like to know how to get inspiration from games, board games, role-playing games, any types of games for using in your classroom? Then you have to listen to the next episode with Tracy and John. See you there.